saying hello to Max Norman and uh, how's it going with the land of uh, music and producing these days? Well, you know, uh, this is uh, only the first thing I've done for quite a while with uh, Ethan Brush, so uh, uh, there's not much going on. I'm doing a bit of writing and um, uh, not really much else right now. Um, the uh, uh, Up until now, I haven't really had much time to do any uh, real production or engineering, so... Uh, uh, Ethan is really about the first thing I've done for a long time. Did you kind of like disappear from the scene, like just to take a break out of it? Would it, would it be that the reason? Oh yeah, well you know what I had when I had my children, um, I realised that after a couple of years that um, you know if I didn't take a break from producing, I probably wouldn't ever see them. So I decided I better uh, better take a break for a while so that I could watch my kids grow up at least. Um, you know, because production and engineering, uh, it's really a full-time job. It's like a 14-hour day, you know, six, seven days a week, and uh, it's very demanding. And uh, and I figured, well, you know, having done it for about 20 years, I thought, well, you know, I better, uh, I better find something else to do that uh, doesn't eat up so much time and pays the bills, and uh, and then I can watch my kids grow up. But now my kids are in college, and. Uh, Actually, my daughter just graduated, my son's in college, so uh, I have a lot more spare time, you know. So let's say with the break you took, how's the world looking now in the, in the mixing and engineering world, you know, with equipment and stuff like that oh, nowadays? Well, uh, you know, as far as that goes, uh, it's very similar stuff. I mean, when I finished, uh, when I stopped um, recording, obviously uh, at that point everything was changing somewhat. Uh, I was using uh, an SSL and um, a 48-track Sony Digital. Uh, now, of course, um, you don't need any of that equipment, really. You can do it all, um, you know, you can basically do it all on an iPad, pretty much, you know. So, uh, or at least on um, Pro Tools. So, uh, But I was already using Pro Tools and Cubase and all those things well before that. So uh, I was pretty, I'm pretty well prepared for uh, the way it is these days. Um, I kind of saw it coming. I didn't really believe that everybody would have these roomfuls of equipment anymore, and, um, and that was one of the reasons I kind of got out of the business. I see I had my own studio, so uh, I got rid of that because I realized that uh, it probably just wasn't going to make any money anymore because people just don't have those kind of budgets, and the whole you know music situation was changing. But as far as um, as far as technicality. Uh, well, it's just better now. It's a lot easier, and everything's a lot easier to do, and it's a lot cheaper to do. So, uh, you know, I have no real problems with that. Like the iPad technology you're talking about, what do you think of that? Is it going to get better and better now with this? Oh, uh, yeah, I think it's pretty good. As a matter of fact, I was just doing some writing on the iPad right now. I work on the iPad quite a lot. I have uh, Pro Tools and I have uh, Cubase, so I can bounce around between different stuff, and uh, it's pretty good. I can... I can uh, I can write on it and uh, I can uh, you know burn guitar tracks on it and all that kind of stuff. So it's actually getting better and better. There's a couple of great new uh, products on there, you know sample sample products which are great, drum machine products which are great, and even uh, multi-track products which are great. You can do uh, you can do 48 tracks now on an iPad 3, which is pretty unbelievable, you know. Let's go back to 1983 with the wonderful work you did, like Bark at the Moon quality, with an iPad today. How would that work? Would it be better? <laughs> well, <laughs> well um, I was never a great believer in analog stuff. It was always a real pain to try and make analog sound as good, you know, sound as, good as it could. Um, uh, in those days, of course, we would, um, we, you know, you would record things brighter because uh, you knew that the tape was going to wear and suffer through the overdub um, process. So a lot of the time you would, uh, you know, you would have to compensate for that when you're recording. Um, that was one of the things with doing overdubs with Randy, for instance, was that he always thought the guitars were too bright. And I, w I had to sort of, you know, insist on making them brighter because I knew that by the time we were finished dubbing and, and the tape had gone past the heads that many times, it would de get duller and duller and uh, probably end up where he wanted it, you know, so that was a bit of a hard sell on his part. But um, as far as uh, as far as that doing that that kind of record, uh, we did that record on 24 tracks. So uh, both of those first records, in fact, all the first three, Bark at the Moon, also, 
they were all done on third, on uh, 24 track. So um, that's well within the possibility of doing it on a single iPad right now, actually. So, uh, you know, for probably about four or five thousand dollars worth of audio gear plus microphones and stands, you could probably do the same thing fairly easily, you know. And let's say with the drums and stuff too, like Blizzard of Oz and Diary of Mad Men, you had to make it clearer so that the tape compensate eventually for this? That's an interesting well, uh, you, technique. Well, uh, always, with, with anything you're recording, you know, especially stuff like snare drums uh, and drums, you know, you want to try and, uh, you want to try and maintain those peaks, you know, maintain those, the, the, the transients. So, uh, of necessity, you would record somewhat brighter than you really wanted it. And you would really have to work quite hard to make sure that um, what came back from the tape machine was really what you printed. Um, I, I've been in uh, situations and on, um, that was actually a fairly good tape machine. That was a Telefunken 24 track, but they, uh, some 24 tracks in that era were, were pretty bad. And I would have to actually record the snare on two tracks to make it come back sounding the same as, as it, uh, as, as when you press the record button, you know? So, I mean, um, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of work involved in, in just, in just trying to make sure that stuff you know, actually sounded that good when you were playing it back. And especially after two or three weeks of overdubs, you would then, uh, you know, when you start adding tape wear to the actual, you know, to the to the whole thing, everything definitely comes back a lot uh, duller. Mm. Do you recall and remember, you know, recording Randy Rhodes' guitars, like how loud they'd be in the studio and stuff like that? Oh, uh, yeah, he was pretty loud. Uh, we had uh, a lot of the time, we had a couple of... Um, Marshall four by twelves at the bottom of the stairs in the stone room facing up the stairs, um, and he was using a hundred, a hundred watt Marshall, which is pretty much flat out. So, yeah, a lot of the time it'd be pretty loud. Um, on the second record, we worked a lot more in the control room, and uh, we developed ways of, of being able to work in the control room where he would be able, would be able to uh, pipe the signal down to the amps downstairs, um, but. Uh, yeah, and on the first record especially, he would basically be standing um, in in the middle of the studio, and uh, he'd be working pretty loud for sure. Like, must well, be pretty uh, long wires to go from the basement to upstairs, would have been. Uh, yeah, well, when in the second record, what we did is, uh, yeah, there's no delay, of course. I mean, it's traveling at the speed of light. Right, right, the, right. But the um, uh, the the one problem that you have is impedance matching. If you're going to run a long cable into the into the front end of a Marshall, then um, you have a problem with um, you have a problem with uh, a long cables as far as that goes. If it's a long guitar signal cable, so what well, what actually we would do is run it into the board, and then um, in order to to uh, pump the signal up, and that also was quite useful to be able to. Uh, to change the gain actually going into the amp, so uh, that that made things a lot easier, and it took uh, it took it took a lot of the angst away from running long cables. Yeah. And recording uh, J. K. Lee and Bark at the Moon, same type of um, situation, would you say? Yeah, in fact, uh, I think J. K. pretty much uh, for for the most part, unless he was wanting to get feedback or something, J. K. would be working in the control room. Uh, yeah, for, for most of the time, that's true. Yep. And then they're hearing their guitars through your monitors, basically, or headset. Yeah, yeah, you're basically working in the control room. They're listening to the mix and the guitar through the control room monitors. And, uh, uh, at, you know, obviously at that point, depending on uh, what they needed to do, you'd have to, you know, it'd have to be pretty loud for them. But uh, mostly, uh, mostly guitar players don't mind doing that. They like to be in a place where they can hear everything and, it's a lot better than trying to work on headphones. Headphones are pretty hard to work on when you're a guitar player, and uh, it's very difficult to get them loud enough if you're standing in front of a Marshall and stuff like that. So in a lot of cases, as time went on, people would work more and more into the in the control room. You see that happening pretty much all the time these days. And Max, I should say that one of my favorite albums of all time for the live quality is Speak of the Devil. Do you remember this album much and how the process went with the sound qualities on this? legendary oh, work yeah, you did the, um, we we did that record um that's the one with all the black sabbath songs on it right? correct yes yeah yeah we um that was actually done for as a contractual fulfillment for ozzy he had to give uh, jet records i think a couple of albums 
And uh, that was the fastest way to be able to deliver them and finish up his contract, I think. So uh, we did that downtown in, uh, uh, I forget what the venue was. You've probably written on the album there, but we did it downtown in New York. And uh, there's a couple of interesting stories about that. We, um, that was Brad Gillis on guitar, I think, and um, uh, Tommy on drums, yeah. Oh, yeah, and uh, Rudy Sarzo on bass. Yeah. And... Um, band actually was pretty good but they didn't have a lot of rehearsal time um so what i suggested to ozzy was that um, as we got ready in the afternoon i suggested they did a whole they ran the whole set in the afternoon in the empty hall um just in case uh we didn't get a good uh, recording on the evening and in fact uh, on the album i believe there's about three or four of the tracks on the album are actually from the afternoon session uh, where there was nobody in the hall, so we had to. I had to do some adjustments to that. Had to add audience tracks to it. Uh, had to, um, and I had to try and recreate the sound of the hall with people in it, as opposed to the sound of the hall with nobody in it, which was quite interesting. So that's a bit of a test if you listen to that record. If you can figure out which of those tracks uh, are actually with uh, an audience and which, which of those ones aren't with an audience. And when's the last time you would have heard that, this album yourself? Uh, when's the last time I listened to it? Yes. Um, I listened to some, I think uh, I was doing some, there was a big um, Randy, they were doing that film about Randy Rhodes, that documentary, which I guess is now mired in lawsuits and it's not being, uh, and uh, it's not being, it's not coming out for a while, I guess, if it ever comes out. And I think uh, Peter Margolis, who was the producer of that, was uh, he he was playing me a little bit back from that album. Um, the funny thing about that was uh, we uh, we recorded the album in one day basically, and then I went into the record plant to mix it, and I actually mixed it on a, a pair of Oratones, and uh, we mixed one side every day. And then on the second day, uh, we mixed the first side the first day. On the second day. Um, the the first side was being mastered over at the mastering studio there, and then uh, on the third day I was mixing the third side, and they were mastering the second side, and so on. So we actually got that record done. I think from beginning to end was done in uh, somewhat less than a week. Wow! So it's pretty fast. So we had we didn't really have much time. We just had to uh, sort of you know bang through it, and uh, like I say, just mix it on a pair of Oratones. So. Uh, uh, I didn't really mess with it too much. Um, we were we we the truck was pretty good that we uh, recorded it on, so uh, we just went ahead and uh, and just banged it out, you know. And Max, what do you, what do you think of microphones nowadays? You know how they're being uh, manufactured. You like them now? Uh, you know, uh, I haven't had too much. Um, I haven't been using too many of the modern microphones out there. There's an astounding amount of microphones, and there's actually some really good deals out there. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not a huge audiophile, funnily enough. Um, I, you know, I'm quite happy using SM58s or SM57s for most of the stuff. I'll use Sennheiser 421s on drums. Um, I'm not, uh, you know, the, the only thing I'll probably take any real care about is, uh, on a vocal mic, you know, I might, I probably might get into a tube Neumann or something like that, but, uh, most of the time, I'm not huge. I'm not vastly picky with mics, and especially these days, uh, a lot of the mics are just really good anyway, and they're much cheaper. So, I mean, the microphone technology seems to have got much cheaper. It's the same as um, there's a few things like that, like uh, you know, A to D converters now are so good, you can afford to just go get cheap ones because they they still sound much better than they did ten years ago. So, uh, I, you know, these days. Uh, I'm pretty much okay with almost anything, you know. Everything sounds pretty good. It's much more about the content, I think, than 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 it is about the the actual sound of stuff. You know what I mean? It's it's much more about how the guy plays and whether you capture the good performance than uh, than whether you're using like a twenty five thousand dollar mic or you know twenty five dollar mic for that matter. And Max, what would be some of your inf early influences as you know a producer yourself? Um, I was. Um, I uh, originally uh, I was very interested. I, I like very much uh, Jimi Hendrix. I like very much Cream, Eric Clapton, um, 
And as far as audio influences, those those guys obviously, and then um, uh, probably a, a, a lot a lot of later albums that sounded really good. Um, I was always a big fan of uh, the Police, for instance. I always thought they had a great, you know, good sounding albums. Um, I liked Steve Miller because he had sonically very good albums. I liked. Um, um, Steely Dan, of course, because they uh, sonically they were, they had very good sounding stuff. Uh, so, you know, any anything that was really good, I liked pretty much. Where do you see music in a hundred years from now? Is it going to get better, or is it going to be a diluted? <laughs> well, I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, it you know it's a funny thing, but um, I w- I'm I'm constantly surprised that people are still listening to records that that are now 30 years old or 35 years old and I I find that kind of quite interesting really that that that's happening even with rock stuff because uh, it it seems like there's it seems like there's almost nowhere else to go it seems like almost everything has been made you know so it's very it's it's kind of interesting to realize that people you know people are still really listen to uh, uh, Aussie, the first Aussie albums, for instance, or even earlier than that, or they'll listen to early Cream records, or they'll listen to Jimi Hendrix records. I mean, I, it's really surprising to me that people still listen to those. I mean, they're great, of course, but um, but it, it, you would think that people would have something else to listen to, but it doesn't seem like they do. I mean, there are still rock bands out there, and and it, it doesn't seem to be changed that much. So, I mean, so long as people keep writing good songs, I guess it's okay. Um, you know, stuff goes in and out of fashion. I mean, right now, um, everybody, for the last 10 years, everybody's been tuned, all their vocals have been tuned up with auto-tune and everything, so that everybody's been smack in tune. Um, I see that going away in the next 5, 10 years as, as people get bored with everything being perfect, mm-hmm. and then it'll go back to sort of uh, people liking, you know, sort of, Band, jammy bands. I mean, there's there's quite a lot of people that are going back towards that now. You know, bands like Fish and you know these kind of um, these kind of jam bands that are very inaccurate and out of tune. So uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I they, it doesn't seem like there's a lot more instruments they can invent, and it doesn't seem like there's a lot more types of music they can invent. So unless we start changing to uh, micro scales and and uh, you know stuff like that. Uh, I see music probably being pretty much the same. <laughs> awesome answer. And uh, Max, I really appreciate you taking this time and talking to uh, me. Um, very great interview, and I appreciate it. All right. Yeah, no problem. Anytime, my brother. All right. Well, you have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you again in the future. All right. You have a great weekend, Max. All right. Thanks. You too, man.